All right, welcome to this afternoon's session. I think we're pretty much ready to get started. Uh, thank you for joining me for hands-on GitOps uh, today. There's quite a lot of you, um, so uh, we'll see how that works out when we get to the exercise part. Um, so hi, I'm Brees. I'm from Weaveworks. Um, at Weaveworks, we kind of developed this GitOps model that you're here to learn about today. Uh, I'm one of the customer success engineers at Weaveworks, which means I work as an engineer with our customers. Um, the, you've got lots of different titles in different companies for the same job. Um, if you want to find us more about us, uh, if you want to find more about us, you can find us at Weaveworks, um, weave.works, or just at Weaveworks on Twitter. Uh, do get in touch. Uh, we're a pretty friendly bunch, uh, so don't hesitate. Um, if you need some help, um, jump on at Weaveworks and ask questions. Um, find our Slack, which is slack.weave.works, and ask questions there as well. So uh, today, I'm going to do kind of split it up in three parts. Uh, the first part is going to be some GitOps principles. So I'm going to share with you kind of how I see GitOps, what the principles of GitOps are, as far as I can tell. Uh, then we're going to do a, a hands-on exercise for uh, GitOps, which is a series of kind of things you have to do with a, a cluster. Uh, for this, you'll need kind of a, a test cluster. Uh, you can use your own if you've got one available. You can also use um, katacoda.com, uh, which has test clusters available, kind of a test and learning environments. Uh, and we'll get onto that uh, when it becomes more relevant. And then finally, I'll show you how we kind of realize those principles in the tools we use at Weaveworks. Um, so everything for today, for today's session, is available at that URL. So I'll leave it on screen for a little while. Um, in there, you'll find a, um, Git, uh, a GitHub rep repository. Um, there's an image of the slides. If you click the image of the slide, it'll take you to the slides themselves. So everything is available for you on there. And the slides have also been linked to um, the event. So if you want to find it back in your schedule, you'll be able to find the slides as well. Uh, during the course of this afternoon, don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask me a question if you have one. I might not notice it straight away because there's quite a few of you. Uh, but if you raise your hands with a question, let me know. I'll wait a few more minutes, uh, a, few, a few more moments for people to grab that uh, URL. Just to encourage you to ask questions, the first three questions about GitOps, at least, or about the workshop, uh, we'll get one of the books here. So I, I don't know any questions, you know, not questions about astronomy, but if you want to ask a question about GitOps, then you'll get a book. What books are they? <laughs> we have Kubernetes up and running, uh, two copies of Kubernetes up and running, and then designing data-intensive applications. <laughs> Um, so the, the kind of the first question I want to answer and kind of clarify and lay down is what is GitOps? Um, and I want to do that just so um, we can have the understanding when we get to the exercise, because when we do the exercise, we're going to get can, you know deep in the swamp of kind of Git operations and uh, merge merge requests, etc. Uh, so I want to kind of put a high level overview first so that we understand what is GitOps. So GitOps is a bunch of things. Um, one, thing, one, one way of thinking about it is an operations model. It's how you operate on your infrastructure. Um, GitOps is derived from computer science and operational knowledge. So we've been running Kubernetes for about three years at Weaveworks. Uh, so a lot of the GitOps approach is derived from our, our own operational expertise. And there's a couple of things that come with uh, our, the preferences of GitOps that come from the computer science side. Um, name notwithstanding, it is actually technology agnostic. Uh, you could do the same things, the same kind of things with other version control systems. So if you want mercurial ops, uh, you could do. We like Git for some interesting reasons to do with security and uh, auditability. But you can do it with other version control systems. And it's really about the principles, not the how. I mean, we've worked, so we, we build tools about how to do this. But really, uh, this session is about trans kind of transferring to you the principles, the why of GitOps, not just the how. Of course, if you want to learn more about the how, come and talk to me afterwards, and I'll show you kind of how at the end of the session, how we do things at Weaveworks. 
and kind of the, the goal here is to speed up your team, to speed up your de development, to be able to make changes safely and securely to complex applications, uh, especially uh, when we're talking about Kubernetes. So these are kind of the four principles of GitOps as I see them. Uh, and I'll go through them one by one. So the first one is the entire system is described declaratively. That means that everything in our system is described as data, right? It's not just code, it's data. Uh, data is implementation dependent. You don't need a particular tool to deal with data. Uh, even kind of very novice programmers within the first six, six weeks are able to read and write structured data. It's very easy to abstract in simple ways, right? Data abstraction, data templates are something that pretty much everybody here is familiar with. We're using them a lot. It's easy to validate for correctness. That is non-negligible, because if you have infrastructure as code that is defined as a set of code, a set of steps to take, actually defining that hits uh, kind of you, uh, verifying that this is correct, that the steps are correct, um, actually takes you up all the way to the halting problem, because you can't decide whether a set of code that configures your application is correct. It's very easy to do with data, to validate data, but it's a much harder job to validate code that defines your infrastructure, which is why data is so important here. Um, and it's easy to generate and manipulate from code, right? It's very easy to read and write data. So how is that different from infrastructure as code? The issue we had with infrastructure as code is that a lot of the time we, we met people and what they, the principles of infrastructure as code is very much about kind of data-driven declarative uh, definitions. But we found people who kind of put upon a bunch of shell scripts in a repository and thought they had infrastructure as code. This is not the same thing, right? So it's about consistency is the failure case. There's a big difference. Uh, between kind of having some shell scripts running where something could go wrong in the middle. So if something goes wrong in the middle, you're ending up in a, with an inconsistent system state that you don't know about, right? There's a state of the system is now kind of up for grabs. You don't know what's going on. So doing declarative definitions of your system means that you can think of transitions between state as transactions, uh, which is a very good thing, right? This is kind of a very good way of thinking about your systems. So the next step is the canonical desired state of the system is versioned with Git. Right? So you have, the, you have this dec declaration of your system. Uh, you really want to have that declaration uh, stored in a version control system. Um, and this is like your one canonical source of truth. You want a single place in your system that says, this is the source of truth about my system. Everything else is derived and driven from that source of, that source of truth. It trivializes rollbacks, right? Because a rollback now, it just becomes a git revert. Um, you just git revert to commit, and then you just roll back your application state. It has ex excellent security guarantees. I, I will openly challenge anybody to find a better system for storing sets of change than git in a more secure way. Uh, you can do things like use your key to sign commits, et cetera, to enforce very strong security guarantees about authorship and provenance of your code. Um, you can build very sophisticated approvals process on top of this as well. So we already have those. We have pull request, merge request processes. Uh, we use them all the time as developers. Um, and, and this is kind of a good way of thinking about your bringing those tools to your application. And beyond just human approval processes, we can integrate machine verification uh, with our processes as well. So for example, it's a really great place for software and humans to collaborate. Um, if you have a merge request or a pull request, you can have a, a software check, say, let's say you have a security auditing tool that runs through all your application code. Uh, you might have that approve or deny a merge request. So it's a really great point when you've got a Git repository to have your humans deal with the code, but also your machine deal with the code. And this links back to having the, dec the state declared, um, kind of de 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 declaratively defined. Uh, because that declaration is readable by both humans and machine. So approved changes to the desired state are automatically applied to the system. You've got this kind of magic land of declared state. Uh, the next step is you don't just want that to live on its own. You want that, those changes, any change to that state to be automatically applied to your system. This is where you get your velocity gain, right? Um, you get your velocity gain by having that automated. And what's, what's really neat about this is you don't have the credentials to make the change that aren't necessary for the person creating the commit. So the credentials to poke in your cluster and change things don't have to live anywhere outside of your cluster. 
So you have like a segregated environment, and the declared, the, kind of the state definition can live outside of that. Because it's a de data declared in Git, you can ensure its provenance and its security, even though it lives outside of your firewall. And then use that to drive your internal systems without ever le letting your authentication keys and your credentials outside of your kind of walled garden. So separating what and how, what you do and how you're going to do. And the next step is now you've got this system that kind of automatically updates based when you do a state change. The next thing you want to do is to have software agents that continuously ensure correctness, right? Your, and will alert you if there ever diverges. So you're continuously checking that your running system meets your expectations. You've encoded your expectations. You've done a lot of work encoding your expectations. Now you want software that will tell you whenever reality does not match your expectations. And it means that you can self-heal, right? The, the expectations means that you can, if you've got those declared well, it means that your system can go, okay, that's happening, that deployment should, uh, should exist, but it doesn't, let me make sure it does. Which means that the system, system can self-heal. And this is not just self-healing from you know, a node going down or a pod failing, which Kubernetes does, but a broader aspect of failing in the case of human errors. Right? It's a really, really great way of recovering from um, PEPCAC errors, errors that come from the human operator. It's kind of the control loop for your operations. So those are kind of the four principles of how I like to think about GitOps. You know, the entire system is described declaratively. Canonical state of the system is version with Git. Uh, approved changes to the desired state are automatically applied to the system. And software agents ensure correctness and alert on divergence. So just to give you an idea of kind of what the pipeline, the traditional pipeline looks like, this is a traditional pipeline example. So you can see in the middle there's a CI step. So you typically, the CI system, your CI system will have access to your cluster and will start poking stuff into your cluster uh, when it has a new image built, right? You'll have some code in your CI uh, code pipeline that will actually modify your system. What we're doing is remo removing all the control from the CI pipeline. We're moving the control into a config repository um, that keeps the canonical state of the system. So you have one repository for your code, for your application code, one for your system configuration. And that's what drives your system, your, cl your cluster. Uh, and you'll notice that the, kind of the permissions to modify the cluster now no longer live anywhere uh, on the container registry, the CI, or your code repository. Right? They, they don't need authorization to do that. And then you have the operator, that's you, or, or one of your team members, who is going to be um, working with that configuration repository. And you can enforce some very good kind of some um, whatever your process is, your approval process is, you can enforce it at that level. Because you can guarantee provenance and origin, et cetera, on the configuration repository. If you have a good process for enforcing your constraints, that's got some very good security guarantees. And then the actual state is very well versioned, and you can audit what happened, who did it, and when and why. So I, I kind of like to think about this uh, like functional reactive programming for your infrastructure. It's like React in that you have a state, and then your view is derived directly from the state, and it automatically updates. It's exactly like that for your application. So if you're a web developer, the ideas should be somewhat familiar. So what should be GitOps? And, and I apologize in advance for GitOps. That's a terrible term, um, uh, offense against English grammar. Um, but what should actually be put under the term GitOps, right? A lot of things. So your Kubernetes manifests, that's a basic no-brainer, right? We all know the Kubernetes manifest, uh, you know, a declaration of your state, that's great. Uh, application configuration is as config maps in your Kubernetes manifest, that's perfect. Your provisioning script, your Terraform uh, state for your kind of cluster and your provisioning, that's also kind of standard stuff to put in there. Beyond that, though, we want to have the entire system defined, and that includes things like dashboards, you know, your dashboard, dashboards should be versioned, they should be in Git, you should have access control to your dashboard that's properly set up. You should have a pipeline, a continuous deployment pipeline for your dashboards. Same for your alerts, you know, your, all your alert definition. If your alerts live in some third-party soft tool uh, somewhere that you don't, kind of, you, don't, you can only drive them through the UI, what happens when something goes down? What happens when something goes wrong? How do you recreate that, right? So your alerts deserve to live and be first-class citizens. Same with your playbooks or runbooks. Your playbooks and runbooks are the things that you use when you're on call, you get an alert, something has gone, gone wrong. The playbooks are the source of information for the on-call engineer. 
So you're woken up at three in the morning, the alert says service XYZ has gone down, your first kind of instinct is to go into your playbooks, look up what is service XYZ, what are the common failure modes, how do I fix it if it goes wrong? And then you kind of go further, right? Your application checklists. In, uh, for WeaveWorks, for example, internally, we encode best practices for our application in a small YAML file. And we have a CI step that enforces that those things actually uh, are true for our services. So when you release a new services, it has to have dashboards, it has to have alerts, it has to have, docu it has to have documentation. So we're enforcing those kind of fairly high level process ideas automatically by putting them in Git and saying, yes, uh, this service has all those attributes. And if it doesn't, we have an explicit exemption uh, with a note from the person who made the exemption. A recording rule, things to do with Prometheus and monitoring. Yeah. yeah. Um, so not the application checklist. That's kind of deep in the internals of our code, but yeah. Uh, so the recording rules are kind of the Prometheus rules that you're going to be using to define alerts, metrics, et cetera. And then your sealed secrets. So if you look up Bitnami sealed secret, that's a way of doing secrets management using the GitOps approach. So everything, right? Your entire system should be, um, you should be able to have a complete view of your entire system, be able to reproduce the entire thing in a new environment with a few clicks, right? If you, if you have problem recreating your entire system, including the alerts, including all the process steps, you're in trouble, right? You, you now have a system that you're no longer in control of, and if something goes wrong, you're, you're out of luck. So this is, I'm just gonna give you an idea of kind of where we apply this. Uh, this is an alert definition in Git. Uh, in this case, we are we're using a Terraform provider for Git, GitHub to ensure that the defined state of our GitHub authorization, kind of the roles in GitHub, matches um, the actual state of GitHub at any time. So if something doesn't, doesn't look, this is, for example, um, a definition of GitHub membership for me. Uh, it's username Brees, role admin. So this is like declaration in the Terraform format of my role within GitHub. I've, because we've kind of kept pushing that approach, now I can have all the power I used to have as an admin, but as a normal user. So actually, that's, this is out of date. I should now be just a regular member. But the point is, if something happens, if that diverges, we automatically get an alert, right? If the roles don't match our expectations, we get an alert. Um, so we've configured it to give us an alert. You could easily configure it the same, uh, the same tools to change the roles back. You know, so if somebody gives permissions uh, without kind of accidentally, unwillingly, or maliciously, the roles immediately change it back. So that kind of should give you an idea of kind of um, what GitOps is about, right? And some of the principles that make it work. And you, can, you should be able to see that you can embody this anywhere you want, right? This is not just a particular tool, it's a set of approaches. And in fact, you'll probably use multiple tools to make that work. So a lot of the Ansible playbooks will have just the um, imperative code in them. Uh, and that's where you end up with state that's just, you're not sure what state your system is in. Um, that's the big difference, right? That's the massive difference. Uh, because in practice, things do go wrong all the time. And Ansible, when an Ansible playbook fails uh, to perform its task, you're stuck somewhere in the middle and you're not quite sure what the state of your system is in. If you actually do manipulate the state instead of the instructions, um, you have better properties around kind of retrying things, uh, knowing that you can retry successfully, et cetera. Uh, and Kubernetes lends itself very well to that approach, right, because that's what it does. Um, and, and I agree, like some systems won't have, um, won't already have the abilities to work like this. Uh, so it's often a case that you kind of have to put a, a layer on top in order to make it work. GitHub is one example, right? GitHub does not have a, that, that's a, you, you're putting a declarative interface on top. I mean, it has a REST API, so essentially what you're doing is you're kind of layering the re on top of the REST API. Okay, so now let's kind of try this. Now we've kind of gone at the high level, let's kind of go down a level and um, actually try and implement this. So there should be a repository at that URL. All the instructions should be on the repository. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to slowly go through it myself, um, give you an idea of kind of um, how to do things. If you wanna go and kind of 
uh, go ahead and keep going and kind of I can catch up with you a little bit later. Just be mindful that if you ask questions, I might not be able to, um, it might not be useful to answer them until everybody's caught up with you. So, um, for the interactive environment that you're going to be using, I highly recommend you try Catacoda. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to deal with that many people in the room at the same time, um, so we'll see. If you don't want to try that, if you have a way of provisioning a cluster yourself, then please do use it. If you have Minikube installed, that's perfect. That'll work with Minikube. Uh, so anything like that. So um, otherwise, if you want to use Katakoda, you Katakoda, C-K-A-T-A. -A, it's all linked in the uh, repository. Uh, scroll down and grab the playgrounds and click uh, Kubernetes Playground, Explore Playground. And you'll be given a, a playground. Most of the instructions, so if I click Start Scenario, so most of the instructions you want to send to the master node. In here. Um, I'm not actually going to use Katakoda myself, uh, just in case something happens and you overload the, the service. I've actually got a cluster provisioned on uh, Google Cloud, and that's the one I'll be using, but you can use Katakoda instead. So I'll just connect to my cluster. Uh, and while that's happening, you should make sure that you have the prerequisites for this workshop. You have access to a cluster, and you have the ability to create um, repositories on either Bitbucket or GitHub. If you can't, then you're going to struggle, because what we need is we need to create a remote repository to, to have the control of the state of your cluster. So you'll need to be able to create that yourself. Right, so kubectl should now, for me, be running against my cluster. Cool. Can everybody see this font size at the back? Yeah? So now, once we've got a Kubernetes cluster and we've got a GitHub or Bitbucket account, the next thing you want to do is clone the repository. So you'll need to clone GitHub's tutorial, the repository you'll be, you've been linked to, clone it in your own either Bitbucket or GitHub account, and then you'll be using that as your remote repository. So all the instructions when I say, you know, URL, URL of your remote forked repository, that'll be your repository rather than mine. I'll be working with this one. I'll be using a... Uh, this particular repository, I might use a different branch. Um, so instead of cloning this one directly, you'll need to fork and then clone your fork. So once, once you're there and you've got kubectl working, the next thing to do is we, we have some files in here that install the, um, the operator that's going to be running the show, essentially, for us. So we have an operator on the cluster, and that operator is going to be responsible for watching the control repository 
And as soon as there's a change in the control repository, the operator is going to apply to the cluster. So now that's what we want to deploy. And uh, in here, there should be a flux repository. And if I look at what's inside, there's um, a set of accounts be, uh, for permissions. So you'll need some permissions um, in, uh, for, for Flux to operate, because it's going to be talking to the, cluster, to the cluster itself, modifying the cluster as a pod. So it needs some permissions and a spe specific account. So that's in the Flux account. Flux deployment is just a deployment of pods. Uh, the secret is just defining the internal secrets that you're going to be using for Flux. So you'll define a Kubernetes secret. And then we've got a memcache service that Flux is going to be using, uh, just for internal efficiency, essentially. So what you want is to deploy everything. kubectl apply file and then give it the directory. And we should see a bunch of stuff come up here. I may, um, I may have some trouble on Google Cloud, actually, with some permissions. So we're just installing the agent, and hopefully it should just work. And we should see they've been installed in the default namespace. Uh, flux and memcached. You can watch the progress. So watch kubectl get pods, and it'll eventually get uh, created. So what what happens next? Now we've got this agent running in our cluster. We need to do a few things. So we now should have a repository, control repository and an agent running in the cluster. So the next step should be to make sure that the agent has access to the repository so it can read and write to it. And we're gonna do that by getting the agent keys and then putting it, adding it to our um, repository to make sure we have access and pointing, then reconfiguring the agent to point to the right repository. It will take a little bit of time. All of these operations um, may take up to five minutes. So um, just take your time. Yeah, sure. So right now, after this, this, this step is complete, so we should have a GitHub repository set up, or a Bitbucket repository. And then we should have an agent running on the cluster. This one, so the Flux agent. Um, however, the operator, the Flux operator on the cluster, doesn't know about the repository yet, and it doesn't have access to the repository yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to give the, the Flux operator access to the repository by sharing its keys, 
and we're going to configure it so that it's, it's already reading the repository as well. Right, um, it's still creating. It will eventually get there, uh, just bear with it. No, there's no Jenkins involved here. Um, so let me move to. So there's no Jenkins involved here. Um, we're going to be using a pre-built set of images just because I didn't want to have to configure um, a continuous integration pipeline. But we'll see that you can do continuous integration, et cetera. Um, as, really, as far as you're concerned for this kind of setup, uh, your operator only cares about the control repository and the image registries. So how you build and put an image in the image registry, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's, as far as the operator is concerned, it doesn't matter. No. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the question was, is this what we use in production? Yeah, we, we use this for our own system, absolutely. Uh, we've been using it since it was built. We built it to start helping with our own system. So the question was, um, does this kind of workflow work for development as well as production? Is that, uh, so yeah, I mean, it works great for development as well um, because you're, we, I mean, our own development cluster is run through this. Uh, this is the approach we take. Um, what happens is we continuously deploy mostly for our staging cluster de or development staging cluster. Um, we've worked with people who've used this kind of approach with some additional automation so that they can create, um, let's say every time you have a pull request, they create a new namespace and they put all the code in there so that it can be tested, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, it works pretty well for development. Um, oh, right, so um, if, if you're talking about like local development, then no, so like the, the internal loop when you're, as a developer, you're developing an application, you're probably gonna be running that on, on Minikube in your, in your own, um, on your own machine. Uh, what happens there, where it's, why this is helpful there is that you, it's really easy to spin up a complete set of kind of equivalent production uh, to um, a complete cluster that's equivalent to your production systems really easily. That's the benefit that you get um, because of this. Uh, but you, don't, you wouldn't use it to drive your local instance if you can kind of just poke it yourself. Uh, so it's much, it's much more useful when you've got like a shared, you know, this is like the, the point is here, we're controlling shared state. Right? Uh, if you're dealing with a state that's owned by a single person, go nuts, essentially. Has anybody managed to get their pods running? Okay, a few. I think I'll wait a little bit more for people to catch up. No, no, so we have a different continuous integration build pipeline. What we don't, so um, Jenkins will do both, right? It'll do the building and the deployment, basically. Uh, we, we use some tool to do our build, and then we use this for our deployment. Yeah, so you could use Jenkins and this. You just restrict the responsibilities for Jenkins to just building. So um, the, the reason we have a, a repository is because we don't just want to push every new image. You, you, so you need two things, right? You need a way of telling it what should be deployed, kind of declaring these are the things that should be on my cluster, um, beyond kind of just the images in the repository. So it's easier to control things from a control repository that has all the definitions than it is to just point the agent at a whole bunch of different registries. Um, I guess I probably wouldn't use the word step, but kind of. So we have kind of the first thing that happens is you have our continuous integration pipeline builds the image, tags it, puts it in the registry, and then the operator, the operator picks up, kind of no notices that there's a change in the registry of new image. It will look at whether or not it has, that, that particular service is automated. If it is automated, it will kind of change the state in Git, so the operator will make a Git commit, 
and then it will react to the change in gate and then apply it to the cluster. No, so in that case, I'm, I'm referring to like the flux operator running in the cluster. Um, right, so we, we have our, let me uh, clear this up. So we have our pods running on the cluster, which is great. So the next step is to get the, the key, the, seek, the identity, the public key for our pods. To do that, we'll download a, a little utility tool. You can do it other ways. You can, in fact, configure the identity. Uh, using the tool is just easier for this tutorial. In a production setup, you probably want to manage the keys more uh, deliberately. So this tool uh, should be, this link should be in the, um, in the readme. Um, you can just grab that. Once we've got the binary, we'll just make it executable. If you want to build it yourself for whatever platform you can do, um, you don't need to use it. You can, uh, as I said, configure the git key in advance. This was pretty fast when I tested it earlier today, but I think there's more, one, more, uh, more of us trying it today, right now, so. Sorry? Uh, yeah, Flux, we built with Flux. We built Flux because we needed it internally and then we open sourced it and built some of our products on top of it. Uh, you can basically choose how you handle that. Um, so in some cases, we'll automate the revert. So if something goes wrong, we'll just automate the kind of going back to the appropriate state. Otherwise, sometimes it's difficult to take an automated, or kind of automated action, in which case we'll create an alert for our ops team. So we have a kind of a rotating, ro um, op like on-call engineer who's responsible for the system. He's kind of the target for those alerts. As soon as something that can't be remediated automatically, he'll get notified or she'll get notified and then they can do something about it. Sorry? Uh, no, I think, um, so I, I've found that Gitflow is a great approach, but not necessarily for releasing software to the cloud. I think it's a great approach for version software. Um, for us, we, we find that Gitflow isn't necessarily a useful kind of workflow. Um, is that, does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the, the kind of how do, we, like, how do we manage kind of versions is what you're asking really. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we use tags. So we use semantic versioning. And what we tend to do is we have, um, we, the, a great way of doing it is you have, no, so you have every new um, commit on a particular service tagged with the branch and the short uh, shell of the kind of the commit um, for the image that's being built out of it. So every kind of commit corresponds to an image. And then when you want to make a release to production, instead of just staging, you'll add a tag in Git, which is a version, uh, a semantic version. So you'll do v0.1.1. And then when that tag hits the repository and the registry, you can automate so that only those tags get pushed to a particular environment. Uh, that's how kind of we, we, that's how we break it down in terms of our flow of commits. Um. Right, excellent. So we now have this utility. Um, you can uh, make it executable. And then we can use it to grab the um, identity, the, the key. So this will give us a public key that we can copy and paste into Git. So I'll copy this. I'll jump into my 
uh, repository. I'll jump into my settings. Add a deploy key. I've already added it from earlier. Um, add a deploy key. Make sure it has write access and add the key. So now we've kind of completed the first step. The first step was to get uh, the agent to be authorized to manipulate and read the repository. The next step is to point the agent to the repository. So in, in the uh, flux, um, in the flux uh, folder, we should have a flux deployment. So we're going to want to edit that file. In the file, there's a bunch of things, um, but more relevantly, there's some arguments at the bottom of the file. So you want to find those arguments. Here. So you've got a git URL. So you'll want to change the git URL to point to your remote repository. You'll have to forgive me, there's a little bit of a lag when I'm typing, so it's uh, not the cleanest. You can select your branch here as well. And we're going to add yet another argument. And the new argument is going to be which uh, folder, so the path we're going to be looking at. So that's git path. And for us, that's going to be deploy Kubernetes. So once I'm done, I can save and exit. I should, should be able to see the change I've made. Uh, changed to point to my repository, added the deploy Kubernetes, and we can see what's inside of deploy Kubernetes right now. So this is the, uh, this is the, there's nothing there, right? There's, there's no changes to that file whatsoever. Uh, so we'll need to apply that to our cluster. And we should see reconfigured, right? We've reconfigured our cluster. So the next step now is to um, grab that. Um, once now, now the operator is now looking at the repository. We can start adding something to the repository, and the operator should pick it up and act on it. So we have here in the examples folder, we have a deployment manifest. That has a kind of an example uh, deployment. It's not very interesting. It's just a, a small image that's um, kind of built in with a good practice. It has things like uh, health checks and readiness checks, et cetera. So what you want to, you'll want to do is copy this image in the repository that uh, the, the Flux agent is looking at. And that's going to be deploy Kubernetes. And now you'll want to make a commit. So you'll do git add deploy.
So you might have to configure this. Um, And then you want to push that back to your um, to your repository. Uh, so it's configurable. In for this for this um, for this tutorial, I've put it in the default namespace, um, just so it's easier to see. I don't have to add a namespace to every one of my commands. But otherwise, typically you'd probably put it in a separate namespace. Uh, So uh, no, typically what you'll have is you'll have a single one running on, the, on a cluster, um, and then what you can do is deploy to multiple namespace based on the same repository. If you wanted to split it up into a kind of separate repository, um, you could have multiple ones. Um, kind of it's kind of up to you, but it's not a typical uh, it's not a typical deployment. Um, so how would the config be changed by different, for different namespaces? Um, I mean the the config, um, actually, so all the Kubernetes manifests are gonna have the namespace in there, essentially. So if they have a namespace specified in the manifest, when they get deployed by Flux, they'll be deployed in the right namespace. So if you wanted to kind of segregate things, what you'd have is you'd have a repository for a particular namespace, and then you have one Flux agent only looking at that repository, for example. Uh, so it's, uh, so uh, the question was, are there, is there any support for detecting differences and removing things that have been deleted? The first one is, I mean, it'll do the kind of, it'll continuously check that the two, that the running cluster and the repository are matching in terms of the manifests. Uh, so that's number one. Um, number two, um, the, for, for this first problem as well, there's a bunch of tools that we wrote uh, called, say, kubediff, teradiff, and ansible diff. That will, con that will proactively check differences in kind of desired state versus actual state. Uh, so you can find those, those are just open source tools. Uh, and as far as deleting things when we remove the files, we couldn't do that. So um, I personally would quite like to configure a cluster like this, but it's not possible, because what would happen is you'd add Flux to an existing cluster, and it would immediately delete everything. <laughs> Uh, so we can't do that. So instead, what we do is you'd have to, you'd, you'd first have to delete the manifest from the repository, and then you'd go and delete the, the actual um, resource in Kubernetes. Uh, that's just um, kind of to be able to support legacy clusters, we, we have to do it this way. Right, so we've, we've created that commit. You'll need to push that commit to um, your repository. I'm gonna jump back into my terminal to do that instead of doing it in the console. So now we've pushed it to our repository, we should expect Flux to pick up that change. And we can uh, verify this by putting a watch on the deployments. So right now we have Flux and memcached. And in the next five minutes, we're expecting a new deployment to come in which is gonna be our pod info deployment.
So it's a good question. Um, so the question was, um, after setting this up, have you ever experienced something that went wrong? What went wrong and how did you kind of fix it? Um, the answer is it's been the other way around. We found that this has helped us fix things that have gone around elsewhere. So we've never had a problem with our Flux deployment um, in production. So we, we use this in production every day. And we've never had any issues with that. What it has helped us do is when we had one of our engineers um, accidentally deleted our entire AWS essentially account. Um, so we, we lost everything. Like, and for immediately, we lost all our services, everything. Because we had everything stored in uh, a Git repository with the daemons, it took us about 40 minutes to half an hour to bring it back. So we went from kind of nothing to everything running again in about half an hour. So it's the other way around. It's kind of, it helps you with incident management, um, but it's never caused a problem for us. The daemons or the process has never caused a problem. So the secrets, so the question was, are the secrets also inside Git? Uh, yeah, so we use SIL secrets, uh, which is a way of encrypting secrets in Git, making them available as kind of encrypted blobs on the cluster, and then having an operator on the cluster that decrypts them for the particular workloads. Uh, so if you just Google search Bitnami sealed secrets, you'll, you'll find the operator that does that uh, by the Bitnami crowd, which they're sponsoring the Wi-Fi, I think, for this event as well. So the question was, can you use Vault instead? Yeah, of course, right, absolutely. There's no reason. I mean, this, doesn't, this is not a restrictive approach to secret management. If you have another approach to managing secrets, that works too, absolutely. Um, this will take a while, um, and the reason it's taking a while is the polling frequency is set at five minutes by default. Um, and the reason for that is we, we don't want to blow up your API limits. It's actually really easy to blow up API limits if you're making those requests 24-7. Um, but it will eventually get there, right? You'll eventually see pod info come up uh, in this listing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There is a way to get to see what it's doing right now. So you should be able to grab um, the logs. So let me show you how to do that. Um. So I need the pod name to be able to get the logs. Sorry, it's a little bit unresponsive. What was the second question? Yes, uh, so the answer is absolutely there is. Um, you can set up a webhook from both the repository and the image registry so that Flux gets notified. Um, you have to do it, if you, there's a few steps involved in the open source version to get that working. Um, or you can kind of use Weave Cloud instead, and that's kind of one click. Uh, but yeah, so you can get webhooks back, so you can get notified of events. Sorry, it'll, um, it's just a little bit slow. Any do's and don'ts around sign commits? Um, not that I can think of. Um, no specific advice around sign commits. I think they're, they're quite, yeah, I've, I've got no additional specific advice. Um, sorry. It will, it will, so it will eventually show up. It takes a while. Uh, just, just be patient with it. It can take five minutes or more to get there. I'm, I'm, that's, that was the original the question just here. Um, and I'm grabbing the name of the flux. Um, actually, you can see the pod info pod coming up. What I'm going to do now is show you how to get the log for the flux um, pod, and then that'll show you what's actually happening. Um, 
so uh, yeah, so I think the, in Google Cloud, you'll need to the, create a Google Cloud service account that will then um, give permission to the Kubernetes uh, account. There's an account, I, I tried it at the very start as well, there's an account issue where Google Cloud doesn't let you give sufficient permissions to Flux uh, without um, going through the Google Cloud console. Um, if you have a look at the, um, if you have a look at the Flux, AP, uh, the Flux documentation on git, github.com slash Flux, uh, slash weave, weaveworks slash Flux, uh, you'll find some information about how to configure G GKE and um, GCP. Right, so to answer your question about to know what's, this, what's actually what the daemon is doing, grab the logs. The logs are there. Um, you can see things like events, um, and you can see it applying a new configuration. So right now, for example, this was the event where uh, the Flux operator actually created the pod info deployment, uh, for example. Sorry, I didn't quite get that. Yes, that's right. So if you put a, uh, the question was, if you put a bad SH key, um, if you gave a bad SH key, would it show up in the logs as failing to authenticate to GitHub? The answer is yes, that's exactly what you'd see. Uh, so if you have an issue, that's the, those are the logs you, you might want to have a look at. Okay, so, so now we've, um, we've actually, I mean, in our cluster, uh, we should be able to see when my keystrokes actually get there. Uh, so we should see the pod info pod running on the cluster. So we've now, the, how we deployed it was actually just changing the GitHub repository. We didn't actually do anything to our cluster. We didn't use kubectl, and that yet, yet here it is a pod on our cluster running as we've configured it. That's ever so slightly awkward. Um, So while that's reloading, you can have a look at the next step. Uh, once you've added the YAML file and you've seen the pod running, you should be able to manually delete the deployment yourself on your cluster. So that's the deployment, not just the pod. You know, if you delete the pod and you leave the deployment, Kubernetes will bring the pod back up. But if you delete the deployment, Kubernetes assumes you that's what you want. So now you should be able to go into your cluster and manually delete the deployment yourself uh, and see that the deployment comes back up automatically on its own. Um, this takes kind of a few minutes for that, for uh, Flux to notice and then take the right action. But it will notice that the deployment isn't there and it will reapply the manifest to the cluster and enforce the state you gave it. And you can look at the logs, the Flux, Flux logs, to see exactly what's happening. It'll pick up that there's no deployment. It'll kind of continuously pull the images. It'll reapply the uh, and then it will reapply the uh, manifest that you've given it. So I hope you have more luck than me on your cluster. Um, what's the, are they all timing out? Okay. We've probably blown the API limit for uh, Catacoda, so I'll have to apologize to Ben and buy him a bottle. Um, so, so the idea here, the next kind of logical step is to modify the configuration and see that coming up on your cluster. So you'll be able to uh, modify your configuration and say scale it up, create a commit, and then you'll see that uh, be reflected in your cluster very quickly. And so now we've done a bunch of manual deployments. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So the question is, can you reduce that cycle time, the five minute cycle time? Absolutely, yeah, there is. The answer is webhooks. Um, you can get your, your repository and also your image registry to send uh, webhooks to Flux, essentially, uh, and then Flux will be able to, uh, once it gets the webhook, do an, do an update immediately. So you don't have to wait for the polling. Uh, it can happen automatically. 
So, um, so f internally, we use webhooks. Um, so we don't, when, I, when you've got the webhooks configured, it'll stop polling, essentially. Um, or it won't rely on it, at least. And, and so kind of the next, next thing I wanted to show you, um, technical issues notwithstanding, is actually setting up to be automated or, or kind of set up continuous deployment so that anytime there's a new image, it gets uh, immediately pushed into your cluster. And what's quite nice here is that there's no magic. What we're actually doing to tell Flux we want to automatically deploy a particular deployment is to add some annotations. And so we'll add these two annotations to our deployment. This is our uh, pod info deployment. And we'll add flux.weave.workstat.net load tester. This is the name of the uh, deployment. And we'll add glob. Uh, equals anything so that any new versions will come up uh, and be deployed. And this is the uh, line, the, the uh, annotation that makes it work. That .NET load tester should not say that. It should just say pod info. Uh, my bad. What's that? Uh, so uh, pod info is hosted on uh, the key.io. It's a publicly available service. Yeah, that's right. And you'll see that when you do that, um, the image that you've, that's there on the example is 1.0.0. And once it's automated, Flux will immediately update it to 1.4.1, which is the latest image available in the, repos in the registry. And um, this is a way of kind of grabbing the version out of the um, deployment. Right? You'll, you'll be able to grab the version out of the deployment. And if you watch that command, what will happen is you'll see the version move from 1.0 from 100 to 141. Uh, that's just a uh, so uh, that's just a typo. I copy pasted from the wrong uh, from the wrong scripts. So here, that should say pod info. So once you've managed to kind of get your deployment um, going so that you're automatically deployed, um, you, what you'll see is that the Flux agent is going to start making commits to your repository. It's going to actually make a commit when there's a new version to change the version number in your deployment. So you'll be creating the commit that adds the annotations that says, please automate this file. And then the Flux agent when there's a new version, will actually create the, uh, create the new commit to change the version, just like you would as a human. So now you've got humans and uh, software making commits um, that have essentially treated the same as far as the infrastructure is concerned. And that's what it would look like. So Flux will make a change like this. I can show you an example of those. Um, if I can spell GitHub properly. So this is our, our own internal uh, repository. This is actually where we um, control our own clusters, uh, very much so. And if I look at the commits, you'll see that, for example, here, that commit was made by the agent, and it was an automatic update of a version of one of our files. So this is uh, the metrics deployment in our dev cluster, in our dev environment. And we've got this continuously deployed so that every new version that hits the registry automatically deployed. Uh, so uh, these are image names. These are, uh, so these master dash blah is an image name uh, in the k.io uh, uh, image registry. And we uh, tag our images with the branch name and the commit shell for the source code, just to be sure that we can trace back all the way to the actual commit, the source commit for the application. Sorry, could you say that? If. Uh, 
so the question is, um, what happens if an image requires external resources? Um, so all that stuff should be encoded in your deployment manifest. Any dependencies, any services you're going to need should be deployed in your, de in your deployment manifest, essentially, really. Um, or, uh, and your image should also accept that it might enter a cluster where its dependencies aren't available. If you've got a, a third, like another service there, if that makes sense. So yeah, so the, I think the question is kind of what happens if you if you need another service on your cluster for version two to work? Is that right? Okay, uh, I mean in that case you'd have to obviously deploy your dependencies with or before your new version. Um, and so Flux will literally just synchronize whatever is in your Git repository to your cluster. It won't understand that there's a link of dependency between your images. Um, So, so right now, so you're asking whether there, we had, there is some health check system to ensure that a deployment works, um, and if it doesn't, kind of revert back. Um, the answer is, right now, we rely on Kubernetes, um, and Kubernetes has those checks in. So it has readiness check, it has liveness checks, et cetera. And you can, the Kubernetes will use those for, deplo for deployments. Um, Yeah, so right now, Flux agent as a thing doesn't do that just yet. Okay, so some, some final kind of remarks. Uh, that we've, we've covered some of this actually already. Uh, number one is polling delays, and the answer is uh, webhooks. Uh, the next question might be, does it work with Helm? Helm is getting more and more popular. It's quite useful. The answer is yes, but you'll need another bit of, of um, software running on your cluster. Uh, you'll need a, a kind of a second operator to run on your cluster to be able to understand Helm resources, uh, as well as the Helm, um, Helm operators. Can you use Flux to manage itself? And the answer is not really. Um, fundamentally, there's going to be a layer somewhere in your system that you, that's man managed outside of GitOps. Um, usually, that's just your Flux deployment. Um, if, you, if you're doing that through our, our cloud, like our Weave Cloud solution, what we'll do is we'll install an agent that kind of deals with, the, with updating everything automatically at that layer. We've talked about automate, um, kind of automated deletions of services and deployments, and there is, the answer is we don't do that just yet. Um, and the reason is we would be, it would be dangerous to apply Flux to an existing cluster. And finally, uh, what happens if you have custom resource definitions? And the answer is pretty much what you'd expect. Um, custom resource definitions are just Kubernetes resources. And Flux deals with Kubernetes resources. It's kind of agnostic about what you're putting to the cluster. Uh, so it won't kind of worry too much if you have a custom resource definition there. And that's actually how the Flux and Helm integration is done. We define a custom resource definition that's managed through Flux. And then we have an operator on the cluster that then deploys that as a Helm chart. So the question is, is there any incompatibilities with Flux and other things like Knative, Istio, et cetera? No, absolutely not. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's often quite a nice way of deploying those because you can just copy the template that the project will give you for deploying Kubernetes, paste it into your repository, and then just watch Flux install it. Yeah. Uh, so in a lot of cases, that's quite a nice path. Sorry? So the question is, what kind of access does the agent require? And the answer is fairly uh, permissive access to the cluster, uh, including access to the API, to the cluster API, to be able to create deployments. I don't remember the list at the top of my head. This is documented in the Flux uh, project on GitHub. 
uh, but it is it does require essentially admin access to the cluster, which is one of the reasons why it's difficult to install on GK without some additional steps, because GK will protect you against random access. So you'll have to deliberately create the access um, access account. Yeah, so the question is then the access control problem is shifted to GitHub and your Git repository. And the answer is absolutely. That's, that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and this is, in fact, a good place to have an access control problem because of the tools you have around access control in Git, right? Um, you can do things like protected branches, software validation, signing commits, et cetera, uh, and Git, yeah, pull request kind of things. Uh, so all of that kind of all of those features are now available to you to do access control, which is great because they're very powerful features, um, and it means that you can have a really permissive uh, read access. So you can say make the repository available to everybody in your uh, in your organization without compromising your security, because only the people who have merge permissions on the master branch will be able to deploy code anywhere on your systems. Uh, so that can be a very small subset of people whereas people who can propose changes can be quite large, uh, which works really well because it means that your development teams can now have access to what's running on the cluster and kind of propose changes. Yeah, <coughs> yeah uh, so the question is, does the scope of Flux only address the deployment? And absolutely, yeah. It's a deliberately simple tool that does one thing, right? It only does deployment, and that's it. So is it more than one repository at a time? Uh, yes, it's only one repository at a time. Uh, Flux currently has a limitation. It only looks at one repository. Um, we haven't found that to be a practical problem in practice. Um, we, we haven't found that to be problematic. It's sufficiently powerful that you can, um, you can manage a cluster with only one repository. And that tends to match quite well to have like one cluster, one repository. Uh, because what you really want is all the state of your cluster to be in a single place. So that's easier to understand. Um, and it's, it, you have all, uh, you have access to the entire state. There's no surprise, there's no hidden state somewhere. Uh, so that one to one pairing works quite well. And yes, it would include all the namespaces. So, I mean, it fails to apply all the time for a random reason, right? You know, you, there's the cosmic ray factor, something can go wrong. Uh, but because you'll continuously be retrying to apply, then it'll continuously try, and if it's kind of, after a certain number of retries, if it fails, still fails to put the deployment together, uh, it'll alert you and say, hey, we can't, we're, we're now unable to deploy, please take a look, because as a software, I, I don't know what to do. I'm a piece of software, I'm not intelligent enough to solve that problem. Um, Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, can you deploy offline, on-premise, et cetera, in air gap? Yeah, I mean, we, we've got customers who have air gap systems uh, who need somebody to li literally drive up with, you know, a USB stick, well, not a USB stick, but a validated release, and then they have to copy it and paste it and have it validated. So yeah, and that's how you deploy software in their environment. They just have an internal registry and an internal Git repository. Uh, the agent does not currently support plugins just yet. Um, so you can choose. You can choose either way. Uh, we find it's quite easy for us to just have separate directory in the same repository. You can use separate branches. You can use separate directories. You can use separate repositories. For us, we found it easier to just use separate directories. That works well for us. Multiple directories for each environment. Yeah. Right, so uh, if Flux just deploys, who's responsible for testing the code, installing dependencies, building images? Uh, the answer is your continuous integration pipeline. Right, that, you still have that. You still need to build your software. Flux and GitOps is about the deployment side. How you build the artifacts you're going to deploy is not something that's in scope, right? That's something that other tools do really well. 
You can use Jenkins, you can use Circle CI, you can use GitHub Actions, whatever it is, you can, it works really well because the, the responsibilities in App Split, instead of just doing build and release, you're just doing build and you're just doing release. Uh, so if you're using Jenkins for everything, the biggest sales point is I can half the amount of code you have right now that's dealing with continuous integration. Right? The, the amount of code you have right now that's dealing with continuous integration includes building, but also includes release. I can half the release code if you're releasing from Kubernetes. That means half the amount of deployment time, half the amount of deployment bugs, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that's the value add. Uh, and that's a, that's a real kind of win. Like we've seen that happen in, in real production system where they've moved to a Jenkins pipeline um, that had a bunch of, of deployment code in there, and when they did the, co the when we did the kind of the line of code code count before they used Flux and after they used Flux, it was 50% less. Um. With the emergence of uh, continuous deployment, have people ever tried to improve like Jennifer? Um, do you see uh, with, how does that factor in now? So. Um, they, they obviously use this, but they have a lot of ways to deploy strategies, build their force somewhere. So the question is kind of how, does, how do we compare to things like Spinnaker and the new deployment pipelines that are coming up? Um, I think the, the key is kind of one of the things I mentioned very early is the, um, the fact that you have the state of your entire system in Git, that the fact that you have social collaboration on that state. This is not something that Spinnaker does very well. This is not something that the other tools handle particularly well. Uh, there are other GitOps tools that we don't build. So I think Algo is kind of a, the new kid on the block that um, certainly does pipelines, and they say they do GitOps. I've not kind of had the time to dig into all of the details. Uh, but Spinnaker has some problem around state management, uh, especially in the failure case. Um, I, I haven't done a full Spinnaker GitOps audit uh, right now, but um, I, I think right now it, it fails on a couple of points of what we're trying to achieve with GitOps. Um, to be kind of, it's just a continuous story, right? Spinnaker is in, continu is in um, continuous development, so that, that answer might get stale in two months' time. No, we don't, we, we're not involved with Spinnaker. Okay, so we, we have about, um, about five minutes left, I think, before we have to close up. Can, I think that's about right. So I'll take a couple more questions, then I'll go through kind of what we do with WeFloud, and uh, then we'll close it. So that's, that's, that's a transient thing that's being created once uh, for this particular exercise. Every new installation of uh, Flux will have a different key. Um, Uh, so, I mean, you can cycle the keys, you can reconfigure the keys if you need to, uh, but essentially, yeah, if, you, if you're not going to actively change those, the key lives with Flux, and Flux owns that key, uh, and that's its identity. That's the identity of the Flux daemon on your cluster. So the question was, should we automate the deployment of the key in GitHub? Um, and uh, what's the kind of the way of doing that? Um, yeah, you can use the GitHub API if you want. Um, and um, actually, practically, uh, since this is kind of a one-time setup, you'd probably just want to copy the key. It's, it's quite cheap to do in terms of human cost. If you're spinning up clusters on a frequent basis, which is that's, if that's your use case, then I would say you can use the configuration options for Flux to give it a key, and then use the GitHub API to push uh, up a new key, in which case what you'll do is you'll generate the key set, give the, flux, the keys to Flux, send the public key to GitHub, and then you'll have the connections configured that way. Um, if you're kind of dynamically provisioning clusters, that's, that's kind of the way to do it. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna skip the question. What we can do is uh, you can grab me after the session um, outside. I've got just about five minutes to conclude, so. Um, I want to kind of show you some of the things that we've done at Weaveworks to build an interface on top of Flux. 
Uh, this is our kind of cloud platform, and it does a whole bunch of stuff. And what I'll do now is I'll show you uh, deployments in, in our cloud platform that uses Flux as a backend. Right? This is the kind of experience you're able to create using Flux as a backend. So my colleagues might be poking the cluster at the same time as me. They're doing demos on the show floor. So um, if you get some events, uh, that's, that's probably them. So this is the view of our cluster right now. Um, and we can see that the, the, this is the uh, current running image uh, on the right-hand pane uh, for all the workloads on, on my cluster. And this is the latest available image in my image registry. Yes, absolutely. I can make that bigger for you. Uh, so the, this column here, the target column, that's the current running versions for all my workload. Uh, these, the source, the latest images, that's the latest available image in my image registry. And I can click one of the image. It'll come up with a bunch of tags, and what I can do is release a version. And so the tool has some kind of um, quality of life features that run on top of Flux. One of those is, for example, showing you the resource graphs and custom graphs when you're doing a deployment, so you can see the effect of your deployment on your system. Uh, for in, in my case, um, let me go back to resources. Catalog. You can see the history of uh, changes made to that system. And if I take a look at one of those changes, you know, it's pretty much what we expect now. The changes are happening in, in the Git repository. Um, I can automate the uh, service through the UI as well. So I can release the service. I can automate it. Automate will create a commit, just like we expect when we did, did it on the command line. So it will notify us that the uh, policy has been modified. It will then create the commit. And if we take a look at the automation commit, We've got the automation true that we expected. Um, so this is kind of the view you'd get um, for kind of running Flux in production using a UI for your teams to make it a little bit easier for you. You can also do things like compare two different clusters. Click on the event instead. So instead of comparing to the latest available images, you can also compare to a different cluster. I've got a whole bunch of clusters here. Let me find a suitable one. And then now, instead of promoting from the, um, from the latest available image, if I select a couple of these, so let's me select the front end, maybe I can promote those, and I can select more than one, create a release. And it should show us the, content, the pods kind of being updated to the latest version. So it's created the commit on the, on the repository, just like we expect. And now it's doing the deployment. And we can see four pods being deployed from one version to the next. So that gives you an idea of now we've, we've kind of seen um, how it works underneath the kind of raw commits, how to drive flux. This gives you an idea of kind of the experience you can build for your teams if you want. Okay, I think that's, that's it for today. Uh, I'm very happy to have a chat with you guys outside if you want to continue. Um, otherwise, um, get in touch with us. This QR code will take you to a URL that gives you a 45-day trial of Weave Cloud if you want to try this stuff. Um, it'll be, I think we're going to make it available. I mean, Sonia is in the room somewhere. Uh, but we, we, we're going to make it available for you guys and probably stop, stop it tomorrow. So if you want to make, take advantage of that, then that's today. Our default trial is kind of two weeks instead of 45 days. And do get in touch, right? Do get in touch with um, questions, suggestions, ideas, how you found it, kind of war stories. We, we always like to hear about people who've used this. Uh, so please do get in touch. And I think we have three people who, who's, who are owed books. I think uh, you are one, sir. And um, I think the gentleman here in the front row is as well. And I think you are the third person. So if you want to come back and grab your book at the end, that's great. Thank you very much.